Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Harvard Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're really glad to have all of you here with us this evening uh, for our uh, interesting speaker who's been here, no stranger to Harvard, no stranger to the forum, uh, at least her second time in the forum. And we're glad to have you back. Uh, tonight's conversation or tonight's speech is going to be moderated uh, by the Kennedy School's academic dean, uh, professor of public policy, as well as the director of the Women in Public Policy uh, Center here at the Kennedy School, Iris Bonet. So Iris, please join me in welcoming Iris to the stage to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Trey. It is a, an enormous privilege and honor to introduce our guest of honor tonight, Dr. Hanran Ashravi. She will talk to us about Beyond a Last Chance, Challenges to Achieving a Palestinian-Israeli Peace. This will be a great addition to the critical conversations happening here at Harvard Kennedy School and at Harvard University more broadly about the Middle East and the ongoing peace negotiations between Palestine and Israel. Dr. Hannah Nashravi is a renowned legislator, a human rights activist, and of course, a scholar. And she is the first woman to be elected to the executive committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the highest executive body in Palestine. And she's an elected member of the Palestinian Legislative Council. She's the founder and secretary general of the MIFTA movement, the Palestinian Initiative for the Promotion of Global Dialogue and Democracy. Dr. Shravi has been representing Palestine as an official spokesperson in peace negotiations with Israel since the late 1980s. She received her PhD in comparative literature from the University of Virginia, and then went on to found and chair the Department of English at Bursay University, following which she became the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Bursay. She is the recipient of numerous prizes and awards, including various doctorate degrees. Dr. Shavi has spoken several times at Harvard before, and we're delighted to have her back today. I'd like to th thank Hilary Rantisi and the Middle East Initiative, the Institute of Politics, and the Women in Public Policy Program for organizing tonight's forum. It is our distinct honor to welcome you here tonight, Dr. Shavi. Thank you very much, Iris. I think I have a long list of people to thank for getting me here. And it is my distinct pleasure to be among you again. Uh, is this okay? Can we, yeah. Okay, and uh, I would like to thank Iris uh, Bonet, for, of course, first of all, Trey Grayson, Carrie Devine, and Hilary Rantisi who was tenacious enough and stubborn enough and persistent enough to get me here over all these years. And I said she has something in common with uh, John Kerry these days. <laughs> I also tell the Harvard students that they must be gluttons for punishment because every time they come to Palestine, they have to have a long meeting with me. <laughs> and they showed up today and they're showing up this evening as well, so I guess that's the nature of students, inquisitive and persistent as well, right? So I'm glad to be here. Uh, if Palestine cannot come to Harvard, I've discovered Harvard comes to Palestine, and it's been doing that habitually. Uh, this is definitely a very a, a vibrant and challenging venue for debate and for the exchange of ideas and for generating fresh insights, which to me is much more important than just the fact of presentation or debate. And we do need fresh insights these days and ideas, uh, given the nature of the process that we are engaged in. I will start by quoting the words of our Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish, since they echo the title of the talk, which is a rather a long title, uh, Beyond the Last Chance. Uh, he wrote, uh, the earth is closing in on us, pushing us to the last passage. Where should we go after the last frontiers? Where should the birds fly after the last sky? 
And you remember, of course, Edward Said's book, After the Last Sky. So in many ways, these words are definitely applicable and prophetic. Both Mahmoud and Edward spent much of their lives trying to formulate an answer to the question, where should we go? The and where should the birds fly after the last sky? And the question is not very rhetorical. And the Palestinian people as a whole, in fact, have been engaged in a quest beyond the last frontier and after the last sky. And today we are trying to answer a question together, is there a chance beyond the last chance? Because conventional wisdom is that John Kerry's initiative is the last chance for peace. Uh, but is it? Anyway, this is something we can uh, discuss together. Is it the last chance to achieve the two-state solution, Palestine-Israel? And uh, it seems to me matters are coming to a head now after all these years <coughs> in which uh, we invented and, and we created so many different types of negotiations since 90, the late 1980s and 1991. I always say that this is the greatest creativity we had. We, we negotiated proximity talks and uh, direct talks and indirect talks and exploratory talks and bilateral talks and multilateral talks and we ended up with epistolary talks where we exchanged letters and so on. And now we have intensive talks with John Kerry sort of going back and forth He's home today, so, uh, and I'm missing a couple of meetings I should be in, but it's okay, this is more fun. <laughs> <coughs> These talks that we are engaged in have been plagued by several uh, obstacles, flaws, and adverse conditions. We start with the process itself. It has many uh, problematics because it began with a failure. The failure to stop settlement construction and settlement activities and land confiscation because John Kerry could not persuade the Israelis to stop. The failure to bring Israel to honor its commitments and the agreed terms of reference. It took us years to accept UN Resolution 242 and 338, which meant dealing with 67 as a border rather than going back to 181 and the partition of Palestine uh, <coughs> in 1947, 48. But now, every time there's a new uh, attempt at relaunching talks, we are told that we have to reinvent the terms of reference. Uh, Israel refused 67 boundaries, so let's not talk about them. Uh, Israel refuses to stop settlement activities, so it's okay, let's deal with something else. Uh, we had asked for prisoner relief because they were part of signed agreements in uh, 1993, as well as in 2000, two agreements were signed uh, that stipulated the release of prisoners. Until now, they haven't all been released, but every time they release a batch, we're supposed to pay a price. We don't have much to pay, frankly speaking. I, I told the students if we had Israeli prisoners, we'll release them once they release our prisoners. Or if we're building settlements in Israel, we'll stop building them, if they will stop building, stealing our land. Or if we have you know, a few hundred checkpoints, we will remove them. Uh, unfortunately, the price they asked, and we can again discuss this later, is that we postpone or we do not go to the UN. So they uh, uh, tried to phase the release of prisoners in four different installments, leaving the most difficult ones to the last, and they were supposed to be released the 29th of March, and they haven't been. Uh, the talks are in, in the midst of a crisis right now because the Americans want to prolong the talks, and extend negotiations. Uh, at the same time, they haven't produced results uh, as they were supposed to by April 29th. April 29th is the deadline. And still we are asked not to go to the UN because that would be horrible. Can you imagine if the Palestinians join agencies or organizations? Or if we, heaven forbid, accede to conventions and international agreements that would empower us and to protect our land? Anyway, so that was a major flaw. The other flaw in the process is that they set the, the, the objective as a framework agreement. We don't need framework agreements. I kept saying we, we have signed agreements, we have terms of reference, we have an agenda. Why don't we just go straight to concrete solutions and agreements with a binding time frame and with steps of implementation? 
because this is not an academic exercise or, or a verbal virtuosity sign. We, we need to really get down to business and end this occupation within a binding time frame, which we don't have anyway. So we have a framework agreement. That's what John Kerry has been working on. It's called PAPS, Framework Agreement for Permanent Status Issues. Now, having not come to terms with any of these permanent status issues with Israel, and we can discuss the content, uh, he decided that now we're working on a framework agreement for further negotiations. Okay. And then the, the uh, framework agreement for further negotiations will not be binding. Again, I'll tell you about the content later. So it became, once again, uh, an instrument for uh, getting, for buying Israel time to create facts unilaterally, to expand settlement activities, to steal more land and more resources, to create facts that are not just pre prejudicial to the process, but that certainly can undermine the process and negate the outcome. If you want to have a two-state solution, you cannot allow one side to steal the land of the other state or to uh, undermine the chances of the two-state solution. So now Israel is very pleased to extend negotiations and the objective has become the process itself. Let's extend the talks even further. In the meantime, Israel buys not just time to act unilaterally, but also immunity and cover because Israel has been granted immunity to act with impunity without any kind of accountability, which meant the Palestinians have no protection whatsoever. Now this is the result, of course, of the power asymmetry or the power imbalance that we talk about. And Israel has been acting uh, uh, as, as, you know, unilaterally based on power politics without taking into account the fact that these negotiations are not between two equal parties. Huh? This is not a border dispute. This is really a situation of occupier and occupied. This is a situation where you have one side with full power and, and with full Im impunity, and you have another side that has no rights and is uh, held captive, so to speak. So without accountability to curb Israeli violations, without protection and or empowerment for Palestine, uh, the, the talks cannot be seen as bilateral negotiations. And when we asked for third party intervention, we meant that we needed uh, multilateralism, the international community, the UN perhaps, even international law to prevail. And I've described ourselves as the only people who were asked to, who were told that they had to ask their occupiers permission to be free. <coughs> and as always, Israel has hijacked the process itself. It became uh, a cover for the creation of greater Israel and uh, to, to get further immunity. And it fed Israel's sense of entitlement and privilege and exceptionalism, that nobody can hold Israel accountable or curb its uh, violation. And since the, the process began, this latest process began, there has been serious escalation in violence in settlement activity, in annexation and transformation of Jerusalem, and in, in uh, 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 the use of live ammunition and other provocations. So this flawed framework agreement is not just flawed because it's, once again, it's discussing principles and so on, but it is flawed because it came to be a self-negating process in the sense that the Americans will come up with a, with a statement, hmm? a draft framework agreement, it is not binding, and each side can express its reservations. Uh, so let's take Jerusalem, for example. The framework agreement will say uh, uh, the Palestinians aspire to have their capital in Jerusalem, which is a colorless, meaningless, tasteless statement, because we can aspire to many things, as I told you today, but it doesn't mean that's a reality. People aspire. And in Jerusalem, Israel has redefined Jerusalem, expanded Jerusalem, so you could pick any suburb in and around Jerusalem to say that's your capital, but not the real Jerusalem. So that's the American position. <coughs> the Israelis will say Jerusalem is off the agenda, even though it is one of the five, now six, uh, final status agenda <coughs> items. It doesn't want to discuss Jerusalem at all. 
That's an example there. So the Palestinians, we will say clearly, that East Jerusalem is our capital. Uh, now, who's going to decide? The Americans say no, they, they recognize that we aspire. Later on, they said we seek. The Israelis say no, not at all. And the Palestinians say East Jerusalem is our capital in accordance with international law. <coughs> and if you can express reservations, then nothing is binding, and then it is really self-negating. It's meaningless. Why have it? I'm sure many of you remember the roadmap with the 14 reservations that Israel had that ended up being more honored by the breach than <coughs> by the implementation. <coughs> Sorry. So <coughs> this process has not shown any respect for international law either, or UN resolutions. And to add insult to injury, we are told that if we go to the UN, that this will be a very serious problem. It's not the settlements that are a problem, it's not the checkpoints, it's not the killing of people, it's not the state of siege, it's not the eviction of people or confiscation of uh, IDs. The serious problems, if the, is if the Palestinians dare go to the UN and say we want to join, uh, what, WHO, something so dangerous. <coughs> <coughs> Another problematic is the configuration of the parties or the participants, <coughs> the whole situation. I don't know what happened. Is there something I'm allergic to here? <coughs> <coughs> Anything synthetic in the rest? <coughs> The special relationship between Israel and the U.S., the strategic alliance between Israel and the U.S., has certainly been brought to bear once again on the negotiations, and as usual, faced with Israeli intransigence and stubbornness, the pressure is always on the weaker side. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> So it's the Palestinians who are being threatened now that if we go to the UN, we will lose uh, the, the support of Congress, we will lose funding, uh, that even Europe will, you asked me to say this today, yes, people don't know about this, that with the, even Europe will not uh, support us, although Europe has been uh, quite positive in terms of its support. Even the Arab world will not, why? I mean, this, this is ridiculous. <coughs> And not just that, we have a new blame game. <coughs> that if you go to the UN or if the talks collapse, then you will be blamed and you will pay the price. So it's the Palestinians who have to show seriousness of intent, good faith, positive attitudes, and so on. And the Israelis can get away with anything. And what's happening now as a result is the weakening of the Palestinian leadership. I talked about this configuration where you have the most flexible, the most moderate, the most accommodating president in the history of Palestine. I'm sure you know uh, Abu Mazen Mahmoud Abbas. He's willing to go that extra mile. He has been going many extra miles, uh, even to the point where he defied us when we took a decision not to go. He said, no, I'm going, mm? in his own party even. And <coughs> They're putting pressure on him, and at the same time, they're saying, we cannot hurt this Israeli coalition if we put pressure on Netanyahu, his coalition will collapse. Oops, well, let it collapse. <laughs> What's happening in Israel is you have a coalition of the extremists, the hardliners, the racists, and the settlers, and the ideologues, all in one package. So there's nothing wrong if, if this coalition collapses. On the contrary, it might be good for, for peace if it does. But we are constantly being told to pay the price of saving Israeli coalitions, as if we don't have public opinion, as if our leadership is not held accountable. All you need to do is put pressure on one man. It's a one-man show, certainly not a one-woman woman show. And uh, that's it. You, you can get, instead of understanding that they are undermining the credibility of the leadership, 
all for the sake of saving a coalition in Israel and for not uh, putting pressure on the Israeli side. <coughs> and of course, Netanyahu is already using this as a PR exercise. We are engaged in negotiations so nobody should criticize Israel. Huh? And again, buying more time and manipulating this in order to lay the blame on the Palestinians. Already he's saying it's the Palestinians' fault. If anything, if it will collapse, it's the Palestinians' fault. Why? Because as they're not going to recognize uh, Israel as a Jewish state. Again, that's another issue. But this uh, kind of coalition certainly is not conducive to peace. And by accommodating Israeli demands and priorities and discourse and even you know, outright approach, you are maintaining the occupation rather than ending it. You're giving Israel advance payments, advance rewards, even from the Arab world. They went to the Arab world and asked them to accept the swaps on the borders, to uh, normalize with Israel, to give them access to airspace, uh, and so on, to trade with Israel, as further inducements to convince the sensitive Israeli government that, you know, Peace is okay, it's good for you. And uh, despite the, the promise of the economic package for, for Palestine, so far everything that has been presented was for Israel's sake. And uh, from the Palestinians, we are uh, being asked for a price to pay for the release of prisoners, which is a signed agreement, as I said. Um, Again, enormous pressure, and most seriously, all these things have had an impact on the substance of the talks, not just on the process itself, which is a process for its own sake, as we said, prolonged and so on. We have seen, not for the first time, but very visibly as a precondition, the introduction or reintroduction of ideological components. I've never heard of this in negotiations where for years we were told, all you have to do is recognize the state of Israel. And it took us decades of debate and negotiations and internal discussion to recognize the state of Israel. In 1993, Yasser Arafat recognized Israel. They said that's not enough. You have to recognize Israel's right to exist within secure and recognized boundaries. So that was uh, Israel's right to exist within secure and recognized boundaries and the, the uh, declaration of principles was signed and everything was fine. And now we are told, no, that's not enough. Of all the people in the world, you Palestinians have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state and as a homeland for all the Jewish people. I have a problem with that. I have nothing you know, against Jewishness or Jewish people or whatever, but I have something against accepting an exclusive state. I have something against accepting um, the ethnic or religious character of the state defining the nature of that state. We have been busy as Palestinians trying to convince the world and, and everybody in Palestine that we want a tolerant, pluralistic, inclusive, democratic state. Why do you want me now to change and to accept Israel as a Jewish state? Then maybe Israel has to talk to other people. Maybe they have to talk to the Muslim world where they will tell them, no, Palestine is an Islamic waqf land, not uh, a, a Jewish land. When you, when you bring ideology into a political, legal, human situation, and you bring God into the conflict, you're not only complicating it, you're making a resolution impossible. It's not just that, but the implications for the Jewishness of the state are important to us, because it's a question of narrative. We as Palestinians have been there for centuries. We are not an invented people, as Noor Gingrich may have thought, or others. We are not fictional. We are not, uh, uh, you know, in a land without a people for a people without a land. We, we are there, and therefore when we accept the... Are you telling me I'm done? Still two minutes? We can talk about the implications for the refugees, for discrimination within uh, Israel, for... Palestinians who are non-Jews and so on. The other problem is the security-based approach. When you define any peacemaking initiative on the basis of security, and especially as defined by Israel, it means you have to have troops stationed there. 
and under the guise of security by giving Israel everything it wants in terms of security, means Israel will maintain control over the borders, crossing points, airspace, territorial waters, and so on, insists on having its troops there. So what have we done? It means that we have redefined, reorganized the occupation, but with Palestinian acquiescence. That is not liberation, that is not uh, statehood, that is not sovereignty. If Israeli security becomes the, the uh, introduction, the framework, and the end all, as defined by Israel by military means, then you're not going to have peace. Uh, this is not, uh, this is the 20th century. You do not need to place your troops in order to have security. For, uh, they need early warning and early warning stations, and I don't know what. I told them this is not the age where you have, you know, uh, cavalry and infantry and so on. You have satellites and, and you can see everything that's happening. So for security, you don't need. Otherwise, you use that logic, then you have to go and occupy Jordan, and then you have to go occupy Iraq, and then you have to go to occupy Iran. That's the only way to get security if you follow that military logic. But in the meantime, the Palestinians have no security. Human, uh, economic, territorial, cultural, historical, everything. Anyway, that kind of security is certainly inconsistent with the requirements of peace. And it, it, it stems from the, the mistaken notion that if you fulfill all of Israel's requirements and needs on security as it sees fit, then they will be more flexible on other issues. Along with that, you have the performance-based approach in which the Palestinians, once again, are on probation. We have to demonstrate that we deserve freedom. So the Israelis are uh, judge, jury, and executioner. They decide whether we have uh, demonstrated, really, uh, the ability to safeguard Israeli security. That makes a mockery of any timeline. It makes a mockery of any agreement. Again, the permanent status uh, agenda has been manipulated. We can talk about all of them, whether Jerusalem or settlements or borders or refugees, which Israel wants to remove off the agenda, or water or wh uh, what I call security. So when we ask the Americans, can you tell us for sure that this process will bring about an end to the occupation and will bring about the Palestinian state and when? There was no answer. They couldn't. So what are we negotiating in that case? And why are we negotiating, basically? At this point, the US does not want to admit failure. And therefore, as I told the students, the most likely thing is that we will see, we will see it end with a whimper and not a bang. Because they will prolong. They want to extend the talks. This has become an objective again. Not what is the substance, what are the issues, not what is the timeline, not whether there will be freedom and statehood and dignity for the Palestinians, but can we talk some more? Can we extend the talks uh, some more? And that would be a, a serious question, a serious issue with, with uh, ramifications for the whole region, because a breakdown in Palestine will, by necessity, lead to a breakout of violence and extremism throughout the region. And I don't think it's in anybody's interest. Uh, the current dynamic certainly is not conducive to a two-state solution, as we see it disappearing and we see a sort of one state, de facto one state solution emerging. Again, we we'll leave that to discussion. In terms of context, whether regional or global, we see the Arab world in transition, a very painful, unpredictable, and destabilizing transition. Probably the emergence of a new Cold War. Uh, and we see blatantly the use of double standards when it comes to violating other people's lands and sovereignty. But when it comes to Palestine, no. There are, again, a new reformulation of the agenda. I, I don't want to go into that, whether this is one land, two states, whether uh, we're looking into other options like uh, uh, having the UN convene an international conference or maybe even placing Palestine under protection for a period. We're trying to think creatively because if we follow this current dynamic, uh, by necessity it means we're going to have a serious breakdown. We need internally to work on our own 
reunification. We need to work on re-legitimizing our political system through elections. And uh, we need to move ahead by empowering the young and women, of course, ensure that any agreement is based on international law and pursue our bid uh, for the UN. Many people said if we do that, then uh, Congress has taken decisions that whatever organization or agency we join, the US will lead. You, do you know that? Yeah? That's very interesting. I told them then maybe we can be the mouse that rolled. Let's join all the agencies and let's see if the US will isolate itself and will leave all the agencies. The way it stopped paying its dues at UNESCO, so they lost their rights to vote. Uh, I don't know if they're going to uh, keep doing that, but uh, I think uh, international law and UN agencies are there for a reason. And, they are th and we deserve as a people, it's not a threat, it's not something negative. I told them it's something extremely positive it meant that the Palestinians are committed to a nonviolent resolution. It meant that we are committed to moral, legal, political, human solutions rather than violent solutions, and they should applaud that instead of threatening us if we, if we said we're going to the UN. And even if by some miracle we are free and independent and sovereign, we do want to join the community of nations. What's wrong with the Palestinians joining these agencies and so on? The one thing they're afraid of is the ICC, International Criminal Court. If we accede to the Rome Statute or if we join the International Criminal Court, they said that would be the end of the world. <laughs> and I said, if, if, if Israel is not guilty of war crimes, then it has nothing to fear. Thank you, I will stop here and we can listen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashravi, for your remarks. Uh, we're now opening for questions. As you know, um, you probably all know the rules of the game at the Kennedy School. Please introduce yourself with your name and do ask one question and one question only that ends with a question mark. We will start right here. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashravi. My name is, <coughs> thank you very much, Dr. Ashravi. My name is Dahlia Mogahid. And my question to you is, what do you think is the impact of the coup in Egypt last year on the Palestinian question? <laughs> you want me to answer one yeah, question? Please, I please. Have. Well, the, f the most obvious impact, <laughs> you're talking about what the, the uh, the change, the CC uh, takeover, or you're talking about the yes, revolution? the military takeover. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's very complex. I don't like to, frankly, to use very emotive words about any Arab country right now, <laughs> especially as they're going through transition. All right. Egypt was the um, uh, host for the conciliation talks. During the Mubarak uh, regime, e Egypt was used in many ways to put pressure on the Palestinians uh, w uh, by the Americans and by the West. So it was directly involved and it felt that it had to deliver peace and it had to persuade the Palestinians to play the game according to American rules. Um, and when the, the rift took place in 2007 in uh, uh, Palestine, uh, Egypt hosted the reconciliation talks and several agreements and so on. And then when uh, Mubarak uh, fell and uh, you had elections and uh, uh, Morsi took over, there was a clear shift and a clear collaboration between Morsi, between the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas in, in uh, uh, Gaza. And Hamas felt that they were too powerful to make any concessions or, or to enter into any reconciliation talks. When Morsi fell and Sisi took over now, they're saying that they feel that they are weakened. They are too weak <laughs> to have reconciliation talks and they need the balance to, to shift again because they're back under siege and so on and they're losing their income from the tunnels and, and all that. So Egypt is a major player, not just in direct relationship to the uh, reconciliation talks that we've had, but also in terms of the stability of the whole region, in terms of the Palestinian question. When Egypt is strong 
and healthy and democratic, it helps the whole region. And it certainly helps the Palestinian question because we need its weight. We need, we need its significance in the region and globally to be able to uh, positively contribute to an even-handed peace rather than one that will exploit again the weakness of the weak. I hope I've been diplomatic enough to tell you what I think. Thank you. <laughs> Move right up there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, when, when Prime Minister Netanyahu was in, the, in Washington earlier this month, one of the things that he said, and he said this numerous times, uh, is that the thing holding up the peace talks is that, the, pal is that Palestinians are, the Palestinian parties to the talks are not willing to negotiate. I'm assuming you don't agree with that characterization. <laughs> um, so my question is, what do you think is the basis for his claim right there in Washington? And also, what kind of incentive do you think would actually have to be given to make, to make Israel finally come and negotiate for real? Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, Netanyahu certainly knows how to uh, enter into a PR game and manipulations. He thinks this whole thing is just uh, um, a question of spin. All you need to do is put, lay the blame on the Palestinians, convince everybody that the Palestinians don't want to talk, the Palestinians don't want peace, the Palestinians are guilty of everything, and that's it. But he doesn't know by doing this, you are evading not only the real issues, but you are trying to escape your responsibility for scuttling the talks. And a lot has, been, uh, has happened, such as the settlement activities that I talked about, the, the stepped up, escalated uh, campaign of uh, uh, the, the ethnic cleansing of Area C and of Jerusalem as well. The uh, building of more and more um, uh, illegal, uh, not just settlements, but infrastructure and so on throughout uh, the West Bank and uh, in Jerusalem. It's not a question of negotiation. Huh? We did negotiate, and as I said, we started negotiations in 1991. I don't think there are people on earth who've negotiated more than we have. Huh? The, the problem is with the negotiations becoming an end unto themselves. Get the parties to talk. Just talk. All you need to do is talk. I call this the Dennis Roth model. Huh? So, lo so long as the two parties are speaking, God's in his heaven, all's well with the world, and that's all. It doesn't matter what Israel does on the ground. It doesn't matter that you are destroying the very objective you are talking about. So it's not a blame game. The issue is to look seriously and see what's happening in reality and come to grips with that. And without ending Israeli impunity, without saying that's enough, settlements have to stop, 67 boundaries have to be accepted, there are concrete steps uh, that can be taken. And when you meet here or, or everywhere in the world, people tell you, we know what the solution is, we know what is needed, two-state solution, 67 boundaries, Jerusalem, uh, two capitals for two states, an equitable solution to the refugee question. People talk about that as though it's easy. So if that's the agreement, then why don't we have steps of implementation? Why don't we end this occupation? Why don't we dismantle, as per the, the roadmap, uh, dismantle the settlement outposts and stop <coughs> settlement activities for whatever reason, they said. Why don't you reopen the Jerusalem institutions that you closed down? Why don't you stop all the violence and so on? The, the thing is, there is a willingness to deal with Israeli noncompliance as uh, an issue of persuasion and rewards and positive inducements. And then when Israel doesn't cooperate, as I said, you put pressure on the Palestinians. And it becomes then a public game of who, who is to blame. The real issue is reality on the ground. Whether there is international law, whether there are signed agreements that should be honored or not, these are the real issues. And that's what we're holding on to. So <coughs> if we extend the talks, why? Now Kerry is at home, everybody's talking about tremendous pressure to extend the talks beyond that deadline, which, was, uh, which is uh, April 29th. He said he might try to convince the Israelis to release more prisoners. But they have an endless reservoir of prisoners and violations. Uh, they have already more than 5,000 prisoners in Israeli jails, and every day they arrest Palestinians. Every day they arrest scores, if not hundreds. 
So what do we have to pay the price every time they, they will release some prisoners? And generally, they release the ones whose term has come to an end. And now, there is talk that the U.S. might consider the release of Pollard in, uh, in order to convince Israel to release prisoners in order to extend the talks. It's, it's amazing, I mean, how far the U.S. is willing to go to reward Israel in ways that would violate its own laws and its own national interests. Actually, even accepting the Jewishness of the state violates your constitution, but that's another issue. So uh, what does it take? It doesn't take more negotiations. It just takes changing this dynamic, the, the courage, the political uh, will, the backbone to stand up to any violation, to hold everybody accountable, to deal with that in a serious way and to understand that it's not just a question of bringing the Palestinians to accept whatever Israel wants, or as we, we've been hearing lately, keep Netanyahu on board. On board what? I mean, it's a sinking ship. Nobody should be on board. Anyway, that's where we are now. We need just compliance, we need respect for international law, and we need parity, equality of rights. Nobody has more rights than the other. <coughs> Hello, my name is Oded. I'm a master's student mm -hmm. here at the Kennedy School. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oshawi. It's not so often that an Israeli gets to hear a Palestinian leader. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my, quest <laughs> my question <laughs> is, do you see the PLO as a democratic movement? And if so, do you still see it as representing the Palestinian people after losing the election to Hamas several years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was Fatah that lost elections to Hamas. <coughs> Hamas, uh, the other PLO components, got very few votes, <laughs> actually, got very few seats. Uh, Hamas got the majority, yes, in, in the PLC, in the Legislative Council. And uh, for many reasons, we can talk about that later, but the issue is that, no, we did recognize uh, the Hamas victory, and they were given uh, the prime ministership, and they formed the government, and they took over the PLC. In 2007, call it whatever you will, there was a military takeover of Gaza, and it became a, a real problem, and that contributed to the rift that uh, I'm talking about. The PLO is relatively democratic. We have to have elections. I said we are aspiring to have a democratic system. Hmm? Now, when the PLO is the umbrella for all uh, Palestinian parties, factions, uh, movements, and so on, with the exception of Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and now there's a new movement uh, that, that is not part of it. The only way that it can, uh, that Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the others can be part of the PLO is if we have broad national elections, not just in Palestine, but for all the Palestinians all over the world. That means PNC, Palestine National Council elections, and we are calling for that. Uh, Hamas has rejected elections so far, it says it won elections, and, and it's that even though the time has expired uh, for the legislative uh, council, as well as for the presidential elections, he was renewed by the PNC for a short period as head of the PLO, but not as president of the PA. There's a difference. So the whole political system is in trouble. It is not just elections that makes it democratic, but of course freedom of speech, pluralism, tolerance, uh, access to the law, due process, all these things uh, uh, can uh, make you a democratic system. We are aspiring to do that, and we certainly do not have any position in our laws or in our society that discriminates against anybody on the basis of religion or ethnicity or gender or uh, orientation of any sort. Even in the basic law, this is very clearly spelled as in our Declaration of Principles. So legally, the foundations are there, the institutions are there, but we have been held in place because under occupation, it's extremely difficult uh, to exercise your democratic rights freely since you are in a state of siege and under control and you don't have any power over your own resources or your own lives. Uh, so. Our democracy is flawed, and it has always been tainted. But at least we are striving to make it uh, democratic and inclusive and tolerant and pluralistic as a system. 
Um, I'm sorry that uh, you don't get the chance to hear many Palestinians. It, uh, it's very difficult to get to Israel. You have to have permits and you have to go through checkpoints, as you know. But I think that's one of the uh, problems. There is an absence of a real discourse, of an understanding the wall that is built now and the checkpoints that are separating us are extremely destructive because they not only imprison the Palestinians behind the wall, they also prevent the Israelis from getting to the other side and seeing what's happening and from sharing and, and taking decisions pertaining to their lives. Thank you, Adel. Salam, Dr. Ashrari. Um, my name is Nancy. I'm a freshman at the college. My question is, um, you said that um, framing the negotiations in terms of security problematizes the possibility of any real um, solution, and I absolutely agree. Um, my question is that in response, um, uh, many um, members of Israeli government would say, well, um, do you, ev historically, every time we've let go of land um, to the Palestinians, there's Hamas has come in, or there's been terrorism, there's been violence. How do you um, propose um, to change their minds about this, to stop looking at it in a short-term utilitarian framework, and how do you convince them that there should be another way going forward? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question, because the, the allegation that they let go of land, this happened once. This happened when Israel decided to redeploy from Gaza, uh, when George Bush was president. And I remember I had long discussions with Condoleezza Rice. She was trying to convince me that this is part of the roadmap agreement. And I said, where in the roadmap does it say that Israel can uni unilaterally redeploy from Gaza? They wanted to remove the settlements, but they maintained the siege of Gaza, control over all the uh, boundaries and the crossing points, control over the airspace, control over territorial waters, they even built a wall around Gaza, and they were shelling daily. So they reinvented a new type of occupation, which is you have all the power, all the military power and security control, but no responsibility. Huh? And I said, if they want to leave Gaza, we would love them to leave Gaza and the West Bank. But they have to leave in the context of an agreement with a handover to the Palestinians, Palestinian leadership. <laughs> and of course, they have to leave genuinely in terms of relinquishing the control over Gaza. And they have, if it is part of the roadmap, then they have to start evacuating the settlements in the, in the West Bank, not demand payback in the West Bank. Mm. They turn Gaza into a massive prison. I'm, I'm sure you know it's, it's a tragic place. It's a place of, of abject misery, and it's under total siege, and it's being strangled, and so on. And then they start complaining that there is violence coming from Gaza. The thing is, the thing is, this is not a way to get security. Security has never been a prerequisite for peace. Peace is what brings security. When you are dealing in such a way as to provoke further conflict and violence, when you have a situation of tremendous injustice, you cannot say my victim has to lie down and die quietly, otherwise he or she proves that they don't deserve peace. Mm -hmm. hmm? No, peace is a basic right. I don't talk about it as a luxury. I talk about it as the most basic of human rights. Your right to live in peace on your land, your right to, to live in freedom and dignity, to be recognized, your humanity to be acknowledged. Huh? And that means that Israel has to understand that it cannot continue to control other people's lands and lives and feel that it, it wants to be 100% secure before it comes to an agreement with its own victims. That's one. And the, the fact is the security that Israel wants can come only if it has a genuine and a just peace agreement with the Palestinians. That's the only way, as far as I'm concerned not by acquiring more land, not by acquiring more control, not by getting more hardware and more weapons and so on. It doesn't need more weapons. We have nothing. We don't have nuclear weapons. We have, we have a few uh, security people who have a f uh, a few hand weapons, and I don't know what they call them, very, very, <laughs> very simple weapons, and they are only to keep public order. So in a sense, the use of weapons, the, uh, the over-supply uh, of, of military, the uh, need to, to have boots on the ground, as you say, total control of Palestine, that's not going to produce security. Because it's the Palestinians who are the key 
to Israeli legitimacy. It's the Palestinians as victims who can say, now we have made peace, now we recognize Israel as a neighbor, not as an occupying power. And that's where Israel will get genuine legitimacy and genuine security through genuine peace, but not by continuing a policy of control, of aggression, of militarization, of injustice, and then hoping that, uh, and, and then saying we, we need peace, and if they don't behave in the way we want them to, then uh, they don't deserve peace. Um, that's, I think that's uh, my response. And they haven't relinquished land. They, they removed the settlements only from Gaza. Uh, they say there were 8,000. I think there were 4,000 settlers. But in the West Bank, you have close to 600,000, less than 600,000 uh, settlers. And uh, they control all the key areas in the West Bank. And they have superimposed a grid of uh, roads and so on, and, and uh, clearly in, a, in an apartheid system. That's where the difficulty lies. Because Israel doesn't have any ideological attachment to Gaza. And they viewed it as a security and military and, and uh, demographic threat but it has an ideological attachment to the West Bank. And the language of ideology means if you think, if you consider these areas as being religious or, or as having religious significance to you, then you're using religion to impose sovereignty and control on other people's land. And I told them the last time this happened was during the Crusades. There were wars in our part of the world on the basis of religion. So you cannot have holy wars and expect to have stability and security. The issue is this is this can be solved. It's not even a conflict. It's a situation of occupation and dispossession. And it's what Elan Pape calls the displacement-replacement paradigm. We know what the components are. And no excuses at maintaining control and more control and more military presence and so on will give you security. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ashtrawi. My name is Dina Shiroki. I'm a master's student at the Kennedy School. Unfortunately, my most creative solution for the Palestinians is campaign finance, but my question is actually on a different topic. I worked for UNRWA in Damascus recently, the UN agency that supports Palestinian refugees, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could talk about what these talks mean for the Palestinian refugees registered in the Middle East, I think five million right now, and if you can specifically talk a little bit about what the situation in Syria means for the 500,000 Palestinians living there currently. Mm. Wow, well, Syria is already a tragedy, <laughs> and the Palestinians in Syria have been undergoing several <laughs> compound tragedies. Um, look, these talks have to have, have to produce a just solution to the refugee question. I don't even call it a problem. It's a very, very serious issue. More than five million Palestinians are refugees, and UNRWA is the only agency that was set up particularly by the UN to deal solely with the question of Palestinian refugees. The Arab Peace Initiative proposed a solution based on 194, uh, which is the UN resolution that was adopted in uh, 1948. And 194 talks about the right to return and compensation for the Palestinian refugees, and not only that, but the acceptance of Israel into the UN, I don't know if you remember, was conditional upon Israel's uh, returning of the Palest acceptance of the return of the Palestinian refugees expelled in 1948. Until now, Israel's membership in the UN is still conditional on Israel accepting the refugees, but that has gone entirely off the radar. Nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about 181 and 194. In uh, the Arab Peace Initiative, it talked about 194, but it talked about an agreed solution. In the um, uh, Clinton Initiative, he talked about a humanitarian resolution. And now they're talking about family reunification that people who were personally expelled in 1948, which means they must be my age or older, and who have family in Israel can return. I don't know how many of those are, are still alive, 
and how many have family. So maybe you have a few hundred people who can return, but that's not the issue. The issue is not a humanitarian issue only. It's a l legal issue, it's a political issue. The, the uh, uh, resolution to the Palestinian refugee question has to be based on a basic right, the right to choose. Huh? They have the right to choose whether they want to return, whether they want to return to what has become Israel or to the, to the West Bank, Gaza, to what is becoming or might become Palestine, or to uh, be repatriated or to be resettled somewhere else or to be compensated and so on. There are different permutations, but the only way you can get to these options is if you first of all recognize the narrative. I talk about the triple tier approach to the refugees. One is you have to recognize not only the narrative and the suffering, but also Israel's culpability when it comes to the plight of the Palestinian refugees, because for years it denied its responsibility, and therefore the fact that it has to uh, take concrete steps in relation to the refugees. Two, you have to acknowledge that international law applies to them. R resolution 194 and numerous other resolutions pertaining to refugees. And then three, you can begin giving them options. But you cannot deny their narrative and their suffering and so on, and you cannot deny them their rights in accordance with the law and then say, let's talk about the refugees. Once you go through step one and two, then you can give them options, and then you can honor their right to choose. And I'm sure they will choose what's good for them and for their children and, and, and to lead their uh, normal life. In, the, in Syria, uh, you do have a large number of refugees. The Yarmouk refugee camp has become another tragedy. It's the, the, there is starvation there. It's under siege on the one hand, and then you have the Jabhat al-Nusra and Daesh inside, uh, uh, it, has, it has become almost beyond uh, salvation. The camp is totally destroyed. I don't know if you've been there when you were there. You've, you've been to Yarmouk. Now it's really, uh, people have a very hard time even entering the place. And we have a hard time getting food and provisions in, into the camp. And there are refugees outside Yarmouk camp who are also displaced in Syria, and you have refugees, Palestinian refugees who are, um, who have left uh, uh, Syria, who have become refugees the second or third time in their lives, and they have no refuge, by the way. The neighboring countries do not like to take Palestinian refugees because they feel they have enough, and that will undermine their demographic balance. So we do have a problem that there, and we do need to resolve it within uh, discussions directly with the Arab countries uh, involved. Um, there were several who died on the way, as you know, when the ships sank and so on, with the Syrians who uh, died. We are trying to get permission, we're trying to get political um, asylum for people who have already left. Europe is discussing this. Uh, I think it's Sweden that has taken more uh, Palestinian refugees than others. The Europeans are worried because they don't want to take in more uh, uh, refugees and political asylum people. I said, compare this to Lebanon or to Jordan or to uh, Syria where they had to take hundreds of thousands of refugees suddenly, as opposed to Europe that is worried about its uh, demographic realities and balances and with immigration problems and so on. So uh, this has to be resolved within a regional uh, agreement. Uh, I think that the Syrians now have become uh, the nation with the most refugees. They've even surpassed the Palestinians in terms of having refugees. It is a drastic situation. It needs direct intervention on a humanitarian basis, and it needs total support, and you cannot leave the Syrian people along with the Palestinians and others who are there at the mercy of such cruel fighting. They are being targeted and they're paying the price. And people sort of skirting the real issues and not finding a real solution for, for Syria are only aggravating the humanitarian tragedy there. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. <coughs> After the spike in terror attacks against Israeli civilians that occurred post the Oslo negotiations, many of which may have actually been indirectly related to the PLO, how can you justify calling for Israel, the victim of countless terror attacks against its civilians, 
to come into negotiations without a clear security mindset and a clear security objectives in order to guarantee the security of its civilians and its people. Could you briefly introduce yourself? Sorry? Could you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Yoav Shaked, and I am a freshman at the college. Thank you. Uh, yes, you have. Uh, Palestinian violence, what you call terror, did not emerge out of the blue. It emerged as a result of a very negative, very unjust situation. So Israel cannot claim always to be the victim of violence and terror. There is violence practiced systematically by a state against the Palestinians. The state of Israel is guilty of in captivating a whole people, of stealing their land and their resources and robbing them of their rights and devaluing their lives. That is a situation that is ongoing. Of course, the victim once in a while resorts to violence. We never condoned violence. and We never accepted violence against civilians. And we do not use long distance violence using planes and, and tanks and so on to shell people's homes. There are individuals who react and I'm not justifying this, and they act violently to a situation that is inherently unjust and basically very violent. Uh, the occupation is one of the most violent forms of aggression that permeates every aspect of your life, as is the expulsion of people from their ancestral homes and lands. So the whole situation is a situation of instability and violence that breeds behavior that is not normal. That's why you have to solve the real issues, not sit back and complain Israel is a victim, it's, the subject, uh, it's been subject to terror. No, we can say the same, we can say much more than that, but that's not a competition over victimization. The issue is you have to solve the cause, and solving the cause we have accepted as a historical compromise to build the state of Palestine on 22% of historical Palestine. The Israelis should jump at the chance so long as it's possible, or as it's still available. If that is rejected, if Netanyahu says, okay, what's mine is mine, I'll take 78%, and I'll see what else I can take of the 22%, that's not going to be a just solution or lead to security. How do you define security? I'm saying let's redefine security. Security does not come from a situation of injustice. It does not come from taking other people's lands or lives. It does not come from perpetuating this control uh, over other people, that's a sure recipe for insecurity and for conflict. You want security, you have to have a just resolution. And you have to recognize that the Palestinians have equal rights. And the Palestinians have the right to their freedom, independence, and sovereignty, and they should not be left at the mercy of such a cruel occupation. That's the only way you can move ahead, and that's the only way Israel can feel that it has a place in the region, that it has been accepted. Uh, but by using all sorts of excuses and by demanding that they have security before, uh, from their victim, before they can even talk about peace, this is a mission impossible. Let's deal with the real issues, let's deal with the causes, and then the matter of security will fall in place. But controlling other people is not going to produce any kind of security. And building walls has been a failed policy throughout the world. Historically also, it's been a failed policy. So it takes courage. I think it takes more courage to make peace than it does to just continue to use military means and more army and more control and, and so on. It's, it's easy to do that. but. That's not going to produce anything for anybody. It will only perpetuate the injustice and therefore the instability and the violence and even extremism because the language of ideology on one side provokes ideology on the other side. If your God says so, then my God says something else, as Walid Khalidi said. Okay. We have time for two more questions. <laughs> We'll take one question there and one question here. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a sophomore at the college. Oh. Um, I had a question about your characterization of Israel's demand to be recognized by the Palestinians as a Jewish state. Um, you raised two objections to it, if I heard correctly. One was- there are several. Several, yeah. but <laughs> two, two main ones that I've heard most often, and one is that one that would be negating your own narrative, 
and two, the protecting Israeli Arabs. So the negotiations at hand are predicated on the idea of Israel recognizing a state of Palestine, which would be a nation state for the Palestinian people. At the same time, recognizing Israel would be recognizing a nation state of the Jewish people. Um, <laughs> That's one, that's one issue. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's too. congruity there. Um, mm -hmm. The second is just because, you know, right now there can be violations against Israeli Arabs, the Israeli constitution is much like you'd want to describe for what Palestine would be, and that would be <coughs> protecting the rights of all citizens based on religion. Now, there can be other ways of protecting Israeli yeah. Arabs. Now, if yeah. that were there, would you <laughs> recognize Israel as a Jewish state? <laughs> Well, the Israeli Palestinians, they are Palestinians. You don't have Israeli Arabs because it's not uh, the Lebanese and the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Libyans who are in Israel. It's the Palestinians who were living in Palestine when the state of Israel was created on Palestinian land. They are the indigenous people. They are the original people of the land, and they have the right to be there. Uh, and they happen. Palestine always had Christians, Muslims, and Jews. By law, you couldn't say you're an atheist or a Buddhist or whatever, but uh, it has always been pluralistic and tolerant. So by saying it's the Jewish character of the state, you are denying the history of Palestine completely. You are de denying my narrative. I can trace my ancestry directly for centuries in Palestine. We are descendants of the first original Christians in Palestine. It's part of my identity. I'm proud of it. You can't tell me this is an exclusively Jewish state. I will not accept it. In the same way as I don't accept Palestine as an exclusively Muslim state, for example. I believe that all states have to be states for their own, for their citizens, huh? not states for a certain portion of their citizens, depending on their religious affiliation, right? That is one thing. Two. You're talking, uh, my objection to the Jewishness of the state is not just the discrimination against Palestinians in Israel who happen to be non-Jewish. Hmm? There are Palestinian Jews, of course, but they're not living in Israel, they became Israeli. But it, it's accepting the discrimination because once you say this is a Jewish state, it means anybody who's non-Jewish does not have equal rights, no matter what you say. And there are laws legislating against non-Jews in Israel that are extremely cruel. The marriage laws for Palestinians, family reunification. Any Jew can become an instant citizen in Israel. You're Jewish, you're Israeli. You I'm marry. Israeli. Huh? I'm not Israeli, no. You're not Israeli, but you're Jewish. You I can go and become a citizen overnight. My two daughters had their IDs confiscated. They cannot come back, they cannot own property, but you can. This is one. Two, two. If you're Israeli, you can marry anybody you want and have family reunification. If you're Palestinian Israeli, if you're Jewish Israeli, if you are Christian or Muslim Israeli, it means you're a Palestinian, you cannot have family reunification if you marry a Palestinian. Only Palestinians are not allowed to be joined with their families. We have a situation of total family separation, even in Jerusalem. If you're a Jerusalemite and you marry a West Banker, you cannot bring the West Banker into Jerusalem. Huh? You have to leave. If you leave Jerusalem, you lose your ID. You enter limbo, you have no ID, you have nothing. So there are laws that are built in, in addition to practices that are extremely discriminatory against the Palestinians who are non-Jews in Israel. We will not support these laws and we will not, not support discrimination against anybody in Israel or in Palestine or anywhere else. Now, there is no equivalence. If you say Palestine is the national homeland of the Palestinians, hmm? of course we were talking about 19th century concepts of states the, today this uh, over lunch. Palestine is I mean, the, the West Bank and Gaza, which will become the state of Palestine, which is recognized within 67 borders as the, the, the state of Palestine. It is the homeland of the Palestinians, but it does not exclude the right of return of Palestinians who are not in Palestine. That has to be resolved separately. If you say it's the national homeland of all Palestinians, it means the refugees have no right to be anywhere else. One. Two, there's no equivalence between Jews and Palestinians. When you say Israel is the homeland of the Jews, 
then what? Is Palestine the homeland of the Arabs or the homeland of the Muslims? No, Pal Israel is the homeland of the Israelis. That I understand. When the Palestinian members of Knesset talked about Israel being a country for all its citizens, they were accused of treason. They want to destroy the state of Israel. Why? Because like all states in the world, a state is a country for its citizens. Huh? Or what, for the Martians? For whom? <laughs> if when you say that in Israel you are accused of, of uh, treason, there's something very strange, hasn't it occurred to you? It's very strange that this is the one country that's not a country for its citizens. No. And Palestine, we want it to be an open country. I told them, if there are Jews who want to come to Palestine, ahla wa sahla, they have to apply like everybody else within our laws of citizenship and, and naturalization and immigration. That's fine. I have no problem with that, but I will not accept settlers who are here illegally. See, that's the difference. Hmm? And Israel, by, by insisting on that, by the way, this is a precondition that is relatively recent. It is something that Netanyahu pulled out of a hat and decided to make it into a prerequisite, a precondition. Now, don't shake your head. I know I've been in negotiations for years, for decades, even before sure. you were born. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know what the, what the conditions were and the shifting goalposts. Okay. No, I'm not trying to score, really. I, I can understand you've been told many things that happen not to be true. I'm telling you the truth because I've been involved in this. So we were never asked to recognize the Jewishness of the state. Jordan and Egypt have signed agreements with Israel. They were not asked to recognize the Jewishness of the state. If they want to go to the UN and say, we're changing our name, we're going to be the Jewish state of Israel, then everybody has to withdraw their resignation from Israel and re-recognize it as a different state. Th this, is, this is really illogical. It is entirely illogical. Huh? They insist on that because Netanyahu says, now he is placing the Palestinians under another test. Now he's invented a new precondition. And if you don't accept my conditions, my language, if you don't all become Zionists, then you do not qualify to talk to me. You will not find a single Palestinian who will become a Zionist. No, I, I, I'm not a Zionist and I will not be. And I don't think Palestinians will accept Zionism as an ideology. It's a problem for the Israelis. We are Palestinians. We have our own agenda, our own political uh, commitments, our own uh, projects, and so on. We don't have to subscribe to the Zionist project at all, in the same way as Americans don't have to be Zionists. People, you do not force your ideology on other people and then say this is a true test, whether they pass the test of, of worthiness or not. No. <coughs> and if we do that, it means also that we have accepted that the Palestinian refugees will have no right of return. Because they happen to be um, those who are not Jews. Of course, there are, there were Jews in Palestine, but, and they're outside some of them, and some of them uh, few in the West Bank. But uh, they, they can go to Israel instantly if they want to. But the non-Jews cannot. So if you say it's a state for the Jews, then immediately you're saying anybody who's not Jewish has no right to go back. And I don't think that's a healthy attitude for any state to define itself, whether as a theocracy or, as a, or as a ethnocracy or whatever, as, as an exclusive domain. Huh? You open up and you accept your own citizens and you accept the diversity of the region you're living in if you want to be part of that region. But if you create an enclave, if you create a massive ghetto and call it a state, it's not going to work. <coughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Sammy Jaton. I'm a Palestinian American uh, from Nablus also, from your hometown. My hometown is Ramallah, but Ramallah. I was born in Nablus. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so My father was a doctor. Every two years he was in one city, and so he has five daughters from five different cities. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, it's always... <laughs> it's 
Uh, just a bit of news about how we reunite Palestine, all of us. Well, you can come visit us in Nablus. And I love Nablus. Back. It's yeah. a beautiful city, yes. Um, <coughs> it's always a, an honor and uh, a privilege to be present when uh, when Palest uh, Palestinians speak at Harvard. Uh, last year, Rashid Khalidi spoke, and uh, he was presenting his book, Brokers of Deceit. Ah, yes. And uh, he I think he went as far as to say that the U.S. was a dishonest broker. Uh, in fostering peace between Palestinians and Israelis. I guess the landmark example of that would be when uh, Palestinians were not even invited to Camp David, even though there was a stipulation in that p uh, peace agreement that uh, there would be a resolution to that conflict. Um, so my, my question to you is, uh, what conversation would you have with Khalidi uh, in his book, uh, if you agree or disagree? And if you do agree, who would be a more suitable broker for peace between Palestinians mm -hmm. and Israelis, um, uh, considering, as you mentioned earlier, or you pointed out earlier, that now Israel has a free hand, even uh, in Arab countries, even go so going so far as to bomb uh, Syria, and then with impunity, with yes. no repercussions whatsoever. Yeah. And thank you again. Thank you. Um, no, I certainly agree with Rashid's book. He's an old friend, uh, Rashid Khaldi. He was with us in the um, Washington negotiations, he was one of the um, advisors. We had different, at that time, negotiations were different. We had negotiating delegations, and then we had leadership committees, and then we had strategic committees, and we had expert committees and technical committees, so we did our homework. <laughs> we never went without the legal advice, anyway. But Rashid was one of the strategic uh, advisors. Um, I read his book, we talked a lot about it, we, we see each other once in a while, and I believe he has a very good assessment of the American role. I, I summed it up by saying that the U.S. brings to bear its strategic alliance with Israel uh, onto the negotiations. So it, and, and I think it was Aaron Miller who said, in negotiations we behaved as Israel's lawyers not as even-handed peace brokers. And it's true, part of the, from my experience, part of the whole relationship with uh, Israel, other than the fact that you have, you have such strange concepts as the, what, Judeo-Christian traditions. I, I still don't know what they are, because I believe the, or, or common values. I believe values are human values, that you don't just have common values between the U.S. and Israel and everybody else is excluded. We all are part of the human values. Huh? Uh, or when they talk about, uh, well, they don't talk about it much, but Israel is a domestic issue in the U.S. It can make or break political careers, so we know the, the influence it has uh, on the uh, political scene in the U.S. All these things have had an impact on uh, the U.S. playing a role in, in negotiations as a peace broker. Mm? Part of the uh, relationship was, number one, never present an American position paper without clearing it up with the Israelis first. I remember they used to bring us these uh, documents, and I would say they sound exactly like the Israelis, with just a thin veneer of you know, changes. I said, it's, where is the American language? Mm? I want to read your language. I want to hear, see where you stand on issues. Don't bring me Israeli papers because you've cleared them with the Israelis first. This has always been a pattern. Uh, to never criticize Israel publicly. Even when your president was humiliated in the White House, there was no criticism of Israel. The, he had 30 standing ovations, Netanyahu in Congress, uh, um, after that. Three, never allow a resolution that censors Israel in the UN, particularly the Security Council. The US used 51 vetoes in favor of Israel, the last being vetoing a resolution that condemned settlements. So that's another thing. Give Israel the legal cover to act with impunity. Uh, another one was never accept any sanctions on Israel in any way, shape, or form. And of course, to extend to that, don't allow the Palestinians to have access to international law and to instruments uh, or to <laughs> bodies that could hold Israel accountable, particularly judicial bodies, the ICJ, the ICC, even the Fourth Geneva Convention, which I hope we will join next week. 
uh, we, we have decided, and I hope that we can get to the 4th Geneva uh, Convention. So, no, I said, again, I quote myself, by no stretch of the imagination can you ever accuse the U.S. of being uh, even-handed in this uh, project. But the problem is we don't have the uh, ability to choose who the superpower is in the world and whom Israel will listen to. There was the mistaken notion, and this is th something that the Europeans subscribe to, that the only country that has any influence in Israel is the U.S., even though Europe is the greater uh, uh, economic partner, trade partner with Israel, but still they think that the only uh, country with influence is the U.S. From my experience, it's exactly the other way around. It's Israel that influences American policy, not vice versa. Israel has never listened to American advice from the beginning of our uh, uh, negotiations or relationship. It's always is the American foreign policy is formulated with an eye towards Tel Aviv or what's good for Israel. Now there are voices even within Israel saying that there's a great deal of chutzpah in this, that we should probably go easy, that we shouldn't have such public uh, uh, declarations and pronouncements from officials, whether they are uh, Danny Danone or whether uh, Naftali Bennett or, or Lieberman or whatever, that we are really maligning the one country that's defending us and supplying us with you know, funds and know-how and weapons and uh, technology and so on. It's the, the greatest ally. So yes, uh, Brokers of Deceit uh, is, is a very candid and clear uh, um, expose, let's say, of the American role in the peace talks from the beginning. Uh, and therefore, he thinks that the US should not be perceived as a peace broker, as an even-handed peace broker. We've always thought that the best approach is to have the UN as the address for peacemaking. That's what it's for, isn't it, the UN? And uh, we tried, but Israel, first of all, does not like the UN because of the resolutions that say the UN is biased and will not comply, and two, the Americans will not do anything that will take us to the UN. On the contrary, they will try to prevent us from going. It doesn't mean we have to stop. We could do that. Nowadays, there are other countries who are interested and who feel excluded. The setup of the quartet, if you remember, is a very strange creature. You have the UN as an international body. You have the uh, European Union as a regional body. Then you have Russia, and then you have the US. I mean, it really was, and it pulled in different directions, so it couldn't get anywhere unless the Americans decided, you know, to impose their will. So, um, and it, it acted sporadically. Only when the U.S. felt it was important to pull the quartet out of the mothballs, it did, and when it wanted to put them back in, in mothballs, it did. Uh, so now there is a sense that we need to activate a more international, multilateral approach to peacemaking. The BRICS countries are interested. Russia is certainly interested these days. Uh, France wants to play a separate role. The Europeans feel that being in the quartet as a regional uh, group is not fair to individual countries who have bilateral relations and who want to develop uh, a role. So we should look at different uh, uh, possibilities. And we have discussed this with the Russians for a while, with the French for a while, with the Europeans separately. Even though when you get them all together, then they say they don't want to work at cross purposes with the Americans. So um, I think I think an American monopoly is not the best approach to peacemaking, and I don't think that it is the American influence on Israel that has uh, uh, plagued the, the negotiations. It's the other way around. The fact that the U.S. does listen to Israel and to nobody else. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here.